Hello, Tim. Thank you for joining us for the session today. I'm really glad to have you. I have been a fan of yours for a long time and excited that we met a few years ago. And so today we want to understand the marketing success factors of Ahrefs and how did you manage to be so successful in a space that is so full of incredible marketers uh, that are really, really strong. And somehow you managed to carve out your niche, take a stand and become really popular. And we want to understand the mechanics behind this. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me, Viola. And yeah, happy to see you too. We've met quite a few times in different parts of the world. Uh, and yeah, unfortunately, we cannot meet in person. So yeah, happy to see you. Yeah, I think it's the first time we're doing a virtual thing. Um, we were between Singapore and Berlin today. <laughs> yeah. Um, so for all the people joining in, I think most people know Ahrefs if they're in the, the SEO or digital marketing space. But from an organizational perspective, can you set the stage a little bit? How old is Ahrefs? How many people are there? How many people are in your marketing team? How many customers do you have? Just we want to understand a little bit where you stand. Uh, yeah, so Ahrefs, I think we turned 10 years old this year, 10 or 11. So I, I, I lost count. <laughs> and right. I've been with the company with, uh, for six years. Uh, I joined as the the only marketer at that time. Uh, so uh, Hrefs was growing kind of without uh, without a marketing department for about five years. So some people from support team and from other teams were doing a bunch of things. Dmitry himself was working on marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, Dmitry is our CEO and founder. And then I joined uh, after about four or five years of Hrefs uh, operating. Uh, and since then, we started gradually building up our marketing. So uh, six years ago, I was the only person in the team. Right now, our marketing team, well, until this year, it was around 10 people in total. Mm. Uh, and this year, we we are expanding it a bit. So probably we are going to land at maybe 20 people uh, oh, wow. by the end of this year. So yeah, we, we've added quite, quite a bunch of folks recently. Okay, I'm, I'm curious about that. What, that's a big change. So I'll definitely want to ask you about that. Um, to kind of like set the stage, one thing I'm very curious about is um, you're really good at like content marketing, SEO content, product-led marketing, right? Um, you really masterfully integrated your business needs and the things that you want to talk about and the audience needs. Uh, you teach SEO concepts. But I'm kind of curious, out of all the marketing strategies that you could have chosen, right? You could have chosen performance marketing or outbound or webinars or lead magnets or a sales department. What what made you choose product-led marketing or content creation as the core of what you are doing? And how did you know early on if this is even working? Uh, those are great questions. Uh, so it's... I don't think there's a straightforward answer to this question why we chose uh, content marketing over anything else. It's just the way it turned out because when I joined the company, like I said, the company was operating for four or five years already and it has been growing nicely, uh, mostly via word of mouth. So mm -hmm. people enjoyed the product a lot. They were telling each other about the product. So what I immediately realized is that we have to ignite that word of mouth and how do you make people talk more about you this is by educating them on what makes you you cool so you publish articles you explain to people why our software is awesome and what kind of uh, results they can get with our software and this gives people talking points to talk to their friends like did you know you can do this with hrefs have you seen i achieved that with hrefs so people start kind of bragging by the results that they get and by the knowledge that they get from us and this is how word of mouth is spreading. So I figured that content marketing was just a great way to ignite word of mouth. As for uh, content marketing uh, compared to webinars, so again, uh, I think here it, it refers to the strength of uh, every individual. Uh, as you can probably tell, and people listening to us can probably tell, I'm not a native speaker. And uh, trust me, six years ago when I just joined HFs, I wasn't as good in talking in English as I am today. So it was hard for me to do webinars. I didn't feel confident doing this. Even the first time I was invited to do an interview, 
I wrote all the questions or on, on the piece. I actually printed a piece of paper with all the answers to the questions. And then I was reading them. It's a good thing the, the podcast wasn't recorded with video. So I just was <laughs> able to read all my answers. So this was my, uh, these were my speaking skills uh, six years ago. So naturally, we did end up trying webinars. So I wrote the entire script and they tried to read it. But it just didn't go. For example, I know uh, ConvertKit. They, they've they grown uh, thanks to webinars quite a lot. But this is because their founder was good at it and he knew how to do it. I was much better at creating content, at running blogs. So this is why I played to my strength, so to say. In terms of uh, like outbound marketing and advertising, uh, Hrefs is a quite sophisticated product. Uh, and the decision to buy Hrefs cannot come like immediately from seeing the ad and uh, reading the landing page. There's quite a bit right. of education involved. This is why when you want to sell a SaaS product like Hrefs, you want to have sales. You want to have people that can like do demos, that can hop on a call with you and answer all, all questions. This is how you can actually convert the advertising money uh, into the sales of your product. And uh, Dmitry, our CEO and founder, he didn't really want to to have a very large team uh like because if you want to do sales you have to hire a lot of sales representatives of each course, of them yeah. has to do like a number of calls per day so dmitry didn't want that and he he enjoyed how the product was growing organically with word of mouth and content so we just stuck to that and we were growing pretty fast uh over the past six years so uh, didn't change much in this approach so I think what's what's exciting about this is how well this is, has played out for you, right? And 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 uh, the growth in traffic and customers that you have. Did did you ever lose faith in the strategy? Have you ever tried something and failed at it and had to readjust, or was it? Did you get positive signals for your content marketing strategy from the get go? Uh, this is a good question. Uh, well, we had our ups and downs. So mm. sometimes you invest a lot of effort in the piece of content and it doesn't fly. Uh, right. Sometimes people just misunderstand you and you might get some hate on Twitter or something. Mm. Uh, but overall, uh, our search traffic was growing for relevant terms related to our business, related to what we do. So we were passively attracting lots and lots of people. We had like a huge kind of pipeline of leads coming our way and signing up for our trial which means that all in all despite the occasional downs uh, we were doing well so we didn't really get ever discouraged about content marketing as a channel and i think what's special about you is you just talked about leads you talked about website traffic you talked about a content piece flying or not but you don't actually use a whole lot of tracking, right? You just mentioned before we went live with this, you you said yeah, like, you're not really using pixels, you're not really using Google Analytics. Can you explain us a little bit? What kind of analytics do you have and don't have? And especially the stuff that everyone considers must do, best practice, baseline, needs to have it, and you're actually not using it. So why was that your decision? And then how do you know if something is working? <laughs> Great question. So a lot of that comes from uh, our CEO and founder, Dmitry. He has cer certain code of ethics uh, and uh, certain uh, ways to look at privacy. Uh, so he basically wants HREFs to respect people privacy, people's privacy. And this is why uh, when the GDPR thing started, we decided that it's a good time to like just drop everything, Google Analytics, any tracking pixels or something, and just uh, think more about people's privacy and respect the privacy of our users or even our, our visitors more. So for that reason, we, we, don't have, uh, we don't feed the data about people who visit our website to those huge companies like Google and Facebook, etc. It might be right or wrong. Different people might look differently at this. Uh, I, I'm sure a lot of people would argue that's a terrible business decision because there's lots of money to be had if you if you can have those tracking, if you can retarget people, etc. But that is just how Dmitry likes to run his business. So, for example, he doesn't enjoy when you visit a website and then they're stalking you with their ads for weeks. 
So this is why we don't do retargeting. If you visit Ahrefs website, we're not going to show you banners saying, come back, come back, please uh, register for our trial. Uh, in terms of what we do track, uh, obviously we track our business metrics. How many new customers we're adding per day, how many people uh, signing are signing up for our trial. And this is actually, if I'm not mistaken, this is still public information. So you can go to the homepage of hrefs.com and near the button, we actually have a number of people who signed up for our trial. So uh, everyone can see how many people are signing up to $7 trial of hrefs every week. So this is a, an important number for us. And as a mark in the marketing department, we understood that we want to grow the number of people who want to try hrefs. And definitely we were, uh, we were always tracking our search traffic. So we do have Google Search Console and we, well, actually I don't even log into Google Search Console that much because I am happy with the numbers that Ahrefs is reporting because we're talking about trends. I don't mm -hmm. care that much about absolute numbers. So if we're getting like 300,000 visitors or 400,000 visitors, it doesn't matter a lot. I just want to know that half a year from now, this number will be growing. So yeah. yeah, we definitely, whenever we publish a piece of content, we target a specific keyword that we want to rank for. And this is what we look at. We do want to rank at the top of Google for the keywords that we're targeting. And we do want our passive sweet search traffic from Google to be growing because we don't want to pay for ads to, to get people to our website. We want to create uh, useful information that would, genuinely help users and they would find it in Google and land on our website and eventually educate themselves about our tools and services and become our customers. Okay. For, um, for the $7 trial, right? I, I assume you do that because you can get people's credit card information. They're probably a little bit more committed if, if they're paying $7 than if it was completely free. Um, when didn't you implement the $7 trial and what was your reasoning behind that? So I actually have a video about that uh, on, on a YouTube channel that I started. It's called SaaS Marketing Vlog, but yeah. I, I haven't I haven't published many videos, many new videos there lately. Uh, anyway, so the story is quite simple. We had a, a free trial, free 14 day trial before. You still had to enter your credit card number because it's just easier for people to continue using the software. You don't have to make a second decision if you like it. You, you, you no longer have this uh, decision, okay, I need to enter my credit card number. You already entered it, so you have to make a decision to cancel. I don't like it, right. so I cancel. It's like easier right. to click a cancel button than input credit card if you, if you like the software. But people were abusing our 14-day 14, 14 mm. trial a lot. So we decided let's shorten the time frame to seven mm -hmm. days and let's actually charge for this to uh, to kind of dissuade people who, who want to abuse it. People still abuse it because it's kind of cheaper to, to pay $7 for a trial rather than sign up for the software. Uh, but still, it's a good uh, kind of qualification of people who sign up for HFs. But actually, uh, just a few days ago, uh, again, next to our sign up for the $7 trial button, we added a link or try Ahrefs for free because we have a free layer right now. Mm. And we're testing what would happen if we would give people two choices because we have like a freemium layer, which is called AWT, Ahrefs of Master Tools, where we yeah. give uh, certain access to people for free. And we just uh, previously it was hosted on a separate landing page, which we were promoting, for example, with podcast ads or which we were talking about uh, on YouTube, etc. So it, it was generating quite quite a, a fair number of leads uh, every single day. But now we decided to see what would happen if we would show this offer right next uh, to the trial button on our homepage. So it's still early to, to say anything about the results. Uh, but yeah, like we, we like to test things. So it's not that there is some sophisticated uh, science or theory behind the things uh, that we do, like how we convert people who visit our website to customers. We just like to, uh, how they say, throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. Like what would happen if we do this? What would happen if, if we do that? Uh, if, if something goes wrong, we can always remove this. Uh, this link from our homepage and continue doing what we're doing, like promoting the free product separately uh, from the main product. Right. 
Yeah, I think that's an exciting one um, because you rolled out a lot of things, right? With the between the backlink checkers and all these variations of your tools that people can try. And my assumption was always that it's partly, and maybe you can verify or falsify my assumption. I, I always assume that's partly an SEO play because if we think about the keyword backlink checker, no one wants to have a 3000 word guide about why it's important to check your backlinks. People, topic search intent, people actually want to check their backlinks, right? And I was yeah. always wondering if that's like a product spinoff that you do to meet search intent and to collect the links, right? Because then you're part of all the listicles mm -hmm. with the free backlink tools. Was that the reason why you made those free product spinoffs or what was that a reason to get people a chance to play with your tools earlier as well? That's part of the reason. Uh, mm -hmm. Another, of course, we are given that we charge money for our product. We are kind of reluctant to give it to people for free because you want to get paid for your work. You don't want to work for free, right? And the thing with those free tools, uh, we don't operate in vacuum. There are other companies that want people who need an SEO tool. So if we won't create this free SEO tool, someone else would create it and rank number one. Right. So in a way, it is also like a preventative measure to stay on top of things. So like in an ideal world where we wouldn't have any competition, we of course wouldn't give out anything for free. We would charge for the, for the work that we do because we respect our work. Like we, we have to take time away from our children and families to sit in the office and create value for other people. So we want to get, right. get paid for this. Uh, right. But yeah, because because the market, because we're not a monopoly, which is good, like uh, competition is good for consumers. We have to create those freebies to, to attract people and collect the search traffic. And yeah, of course, of course, it has a lot to do with searcher intent, because for many qu queries, now uh, we see that whenever we create a free tool, it would outrank a guide easily. So yeah, people of course want to have something something immediately actionable rather than tutorial on how to use something else. Yeah, yeah, that's what I figured. You actually said something here that I'm um, very curious about, which is the competitive landscape of Ahrefs. Um, so. Firstly, you are an SEO tool. You do rely on, on SEO, as, as you explained, as one of your main traffic drivers. But there's obviously a few other household names um, in, the, in, in the SEO space that you're competing against each other. There's also a few others that are good at content marketing. Um, but even not just SEO tools, right? Like an, an entire array of digital marketing tools are really good at SEO. And there are some players that have been in the space for a long time and pretty much whatever you type, they're always on page one for any digital marketing related terms. And that already was true five, six years ago when, when you started. So I'm kind of curious, are you ever scared of your competitors or how do you think about this or what made you so confident to still use SEO as your main strategy, even though there are some really established and big sites in the space already? So I don't think scared is uh, the right word here. Like there, there's nothing to be scared. Irritated is a good word because <laughs> like you're irritated when you work hard, when you try to create like a great page and then you see someone else out ranking you. Uh, right. You're a little bit irritated. So uh, there's nothing to worry about. There's nothing to be scared about. It's just a matter of consistent work. Like you rightly said, uh, I started learning SEO by reading Moz blog. Uh, mm. Back in the day, it was called SEO Moz. Yeah. And uh, when I joined Ahrefs, they already had a huge blog that was generating tons of search traffic for them and ranking for like all sorts of SEO terms, SEO related terms. And they still do. For a lot yeah. of SEO terms, Google shows up to three pages from moz.com on the front page of search results. Three pages. Yeah. Or like one search query it's it's like moz owns uh some topics <laughs> completely and yep. there's there's nothing you can do other than keep working keep creating great educational materials keep promoting them to people so that they would link to them and so that they would give google clues that your content also deserves to rank so right. for some queries we managed to outrank moz for other yeah. for other queries five years later and we still cannot beat them. Maybe in five more years, we won't be able to beat them anyway. 
But the good thing is that uh, there's plenty of opportunity for everyone. There are tons and tons of different search queries that we can address. And uh, like for every search query, there's there are tons of variations. And mm -hmm. even if they rank number one for the main way to, to ask for something, for example, I think three of their pages are ranking for on-page SEO. So they completely dominate the SERP if you search for on-page SEO. Right. But there's still a lot of opportunity, for example, uh, on-page SEO tips. Right. The topic is more or less the same, but you right. change the angle slightly. You, you write an article with actual tips, like a listicle, and now you yeah. have the chances to get relevant search traffic to your website. So I think there's plenty of opportunity for everyone, and especially since SEO doesn't stand still, like uh, Google keeps releasing new stuff that SEOs want to learn. Uh, yeah. People come up with new interesting strategies that they want to discuss. So the the amount of search queries that people put into Google uh, that are related to digital marketing and SEO, it keeps growing. Maybe not as fast as, as we would want it to keep growing, but still some new tactics and strategies appear all the time. And people need educational materials for those things. So you can still get traffic even if, even if you're a newcomer to the space. And from there, like you just build your reputation, you build your audience, and you try to compete for the bigger terms. Right. Yeah, I love to hear that. It's, um, obviously, I run an SEO agency, but we've never done any SEO for our website, really, because our client acquisition was through referral and public speaking, and it was more a branding exercise. And so this year, we first started our very first SEO blog post, finally putting them up. And now Google needs to get to know the site, et cetera. And we're still kind of on the far back end of page seven or something like this, but we slowly started. And because you used the word on-page SEO as an example, I'm actually curious. You have a lot of interesting perspective, right? You, you, you don't track, you're fully committed to the content marketing, but you also have an interesting philosophy on SEO, I think, which is like, how do you actually think about ranking a page? Like what makes a page rank? What's your philosophy behind the content, behind the on-page SEO, keyword optimization, link building, et cetera? What, what, what are your SEO success factors and how, how do you think about that? I think uh, our secret sauce is searcher intent and credibility. So as long as you can address the searcher intent as long as you understand what people searching for a specific query want to see uh, on the page, uh, whether it's a specific type of an article, do they want a listicle or do they want a how-to guide? Or maybe right. that's a different format. Maybe they want like an infographic and not an article. Or maybe they want like an online tool or maybe they want a comparison page, blah, blah, blah. So search intent can be very different. As long as you understand that and as long as you uh, are an expert in the topic, you have credibility to talk about those things, you automatically get good chances of ranking. So yeah, our stance, we don't really like people who talk about shoehorning keywords onto the page, but at the same time, we understand that here at Ahrefs, we are a team of marketers who are exceptionally well educated on SEO. So for us, we don't we don't have to deliberately optimize our articles because when we write them we we intuitively optimize them and we talk about all the right things and we put all the keywords in all the right places so even though we're critical of people who put those on page tool on a pedestal and saying that those on page tools are the reason why I'm successful and why I rank. We don't understand that some content teams where they have good writers, people who understand how to write well, and maybe even uh, domain uh, have some domain expertise. For example, they, they are uh, veterinarians or they're photographers. So they have a lot of expert knowledge, but they don't have this intrinsic intuitive understanding of how to write articles that would accurately address. So they need some kind of tool to, to give them some, uh, some guidance and explain them that you have to use some relevant terms. You have to make your content longer, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, uh, this is how we look at the, these things. Yeah, that, that's, that, that makes a lot of sense because that's also what I see with clients, right? If, I have made the experience, if you give people just a keyword or topic and, and they look at a blank page, they have a hard time 
filling the blank page with something that meets search intent. And I think this is where the content outlines that we do, which tell you this is a skyscraper, this is a landing page, this is a listicle, this is the word count, and these are some headline outline ideas help bridge the gap between the just having the keyword and having the blank page. But um, I think uh, Ahrefs has been really, really good with this. And what I'm curious for you that you have built the marketing team and you continue building the marketing team, how do you figure out that your team members are domain experts? Did you um, hire people that you then trained them up in the Ahrefs philosophy and processes? Or are you trying to hire people that are already experienced? Are you trying to hire people that maybe have worked for some other digital marketing software tools? Or where did you stand with that in the past? And what is maybe your plan now that you're growing your team so much? Uh, great question. So uh, we have everything. We have a little bit of everything. So uh, if if we go back and uh, track how uh, how I hired some of our employees, so, for example, with Josh, who is our head of content, who is responsible for the content on our blog, I just yeah. saw him start a brand new blog and publish a monstrous article. It was like 50,000 words or something <laughs> with, with like 60 link building strategies. So I, I could see he invested tons of effort into this article and I could see he has tons of knowledge. So I immediately reached out to him and said, why don't you join us and do the same thing you're doing for your own blog, but you, you can do it for HFs, you can have some budget, you can have like team helping you, et cetera, et cetera. And this is how I hired Josh. Amazing. In terms of Sam, who is now uh, in charge of our YouTube channel and helps tremendously in, in different areas of, uh, of our marketing as well, uh, he reached out to me. I think I had a job ad for funnel hacker or something. I didn't even understand what do I want from this person. And we started <laughs> talking about the role of funnel hacker. And we understood, both of us kind of understood that it doesn't make sense to hack any funnels at Ahrefs. But I realized that Sam could be a great educator. So he could be creating great educational materials in the form of videos, courses, et cetera, et cetera. And this is how, how he joined the team. And back in the day, he actually had his own agency. And when he reached out for my job ad, he was kind of doing his own experiment. He was trying to get leads by answering job ads of the companies that he wants to have as his yeah. clients. So, but it turned out a little differently for him. Instead of having <laughs> us as a lead, he ended up actually joining Ahrefs. Uh, so yeah, with different people, it's it's different stories. Sometimes sometimes you, you see a person and you reach out to them. Actually, Dmitry, uh, our CEO and founder, he himself saw my work, he saw my published articles at Moz, he saw that I was active in some uh, relevant digital marketing communities. So he also reached out to me uh, instead of me looking up the job ad. So right. it's a mixture of both. We do job ads, but we also reach out to people. I try to network with people. I go to conferences. Uh, so yeah, you never know where, where you would hire a great person who would join your team. But yeah, we, we of course, we prioritize the the knowledge of seo because yeah. if you at, at hrefs if you want to market uh hrefs which is a marketing tool your target audience is marketers so you yeah. are marketing to marketers which means you have to be a, a step ahead of the vast majority of you you have to be like top 10 percent in terms of your knowledge and experience so it, it's very hard to just hire a junior guy or a girl mm. uh, and wait till they get up to speed right. to be able to produce great content. But at the same time, uh, in, in marketing department, you have different roles. So not every member of the marketing department has to be exceptionally knowledgeable in the topic. There, there might be a, a different task for them, which they can figure out as they go, as long as they are smart and hardworking. Nice, nice. That makes sense. And we're kind of like approaching the 30 minute mark. So I, I want to throw two questions as you that you can answer in a rapid fire with your with your plan to grow the team so much this year. What what, what are people going to be doing? Kind of like if, if you want to share an insight under the hood, like what, what is happening there? What's your reasoning behind that? I'd be curious what's in the card for you. And then lastly, obviously, is um, where where can people learn more of your wisdom? Is this your medium, your YouTube, et cetera? Where, where do you want people to follow you? I'd be curious to understand as well. 
Uh, so as for growing the team, the, the motivation for that is very straightforward. Uh, we looked at S1 form that SM Rush filed when they went IPO. Uh, we yeah. saw that they're spending upwards of $50 million per year on their marketing. And they think this year they, they are on track to spend something like $70 million. That's like 10, 10 or I don't know, 15, 20 times more than we're spending, right. uh, which meant that we have to retaliate. We have to answer something to this and we have to grow our own marketing team. And basically we're more or less going to do more of the same. So mm. we were successful in what we were doing. So we're just looking to scale it, uh, do more of it and uh, do it with better quality. So nothing really groundbreaking. We were successful at what we're doing. We just need to do more of it. Uh, as for where people can find me, it's Twitter is the social network where I'm most active and which is mostly related to my work rather than personal life. Life. So if people want to follow the stuff that bothers me so much that I want to <laughs> talk publicly about it, uh, I invite them to follow me on Twitter. Awesome. Yeah, we'll we'll make sure to to pop your Twitter handle into the comments so people can follow you. I highly recommend. As Thank you have you seen now in the last half an hour, I, I I love that you're challenging paradigms and and that you're not just following best practices and you and you're coming to your own conclusion and it's obviously working super well for you, for your team, for Ahrefs, and you've grown dramatically. So congratulations, and thank you so much for thank taking you. the time today. Thanks a lot for having me.